is a name. There is a name. There is a name. There is a name. Precious name. Bless that name, oh Jesus, there is a name, oh Jesus, there is a name, Jesus.
is just another day. That the Lord has kept me. Just another day. That the Lord. Lift your hands and say it's just another day. That the Lord has kept me, 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 me. Just another day the Lord has kept me. I see you all coming on. Good morning, everybody. Happy birthday to the church. Good morning, CFC. I am downtown Shreveport, Louisiana this morning as cars are passing by. People are getting ready for service and motorcycles and all types of things are going on down here downtown. But listen, I wanted to come on today and just to say happy birthday to the church. Welcome to all of our members, to all of our guests, those that are joining us this morning. Uh, I'm on location. We are able to be fluid and we can move around as we need to. I wish y'all could see my setup even right now as I'm sharing with you all this morning on this Pentecost Sunday. I've been on the road, just got in from Los Angeles last night or early this morning and uh, here in Shreveport this morning to uh, preach for a great friend of mine, Pastor Theron Jackson, the Morning Star Missionary Baptist Church for his church, no, his pastor's anniversary, excuse me. So we're here this morning, we're playing triple duty this morning, but I wanted to get up early to make sure that I did a personal greeting to everybody joining us this morning as we are looking forward to just celebrating Pentecost Sunday and understanding the power of Pentecost and what it meant for the church, what it means for us. As we've been pushing the Pentecost these last six weeks, one of the things I want you all to know, realize and understand is that no matter what Christ did on Calvary's Hill, if in fact we didn't continue to move and promote the narrative of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and if Pentecost had not come, and if Stephen had not been filled with the Holy Spirit, and if he had not been filled with faith, and if he had not been filled with the courage to stand for Jesus, and then even be martyred there at the hands of those religious leaders at the time, I don't know if the word of God would have ever left outside of Jerusalem. But today we are celebrating Pentecost Sunday. We are thanking God. And hopefully most people and more churches are beginning to understand just how important this day is because it represents the birth of the church. And so we say happy birthday to the Lord's church. And we certainly thank God that we are part of that as well. And I hope and pray that you are thankful uh, to be a part of that as well. So listen to all of our guests again. We greet you with love. We thank God for you today. To all of those who have joined us uh, across the country and even around the world, we say hello. I'm looking uh, to see as I'm on here with you all now. I'm looking to see you all come on. So we're really happy. You all can hear the background noise. I apologize for that. I'm sitting outside trying to get it done before I go to church. But nonetheless, we thank God again for each and every one of you. And it's our prayer that you will all I'll be blessed by today's programming and what we'll be sharing with you. It's a message I preached a couple of years ago at St. John, the power of Pentecost. And I wanted to share that with you today as I'm working a separate duty at the same time that we're broadcasting. But I wanted to come on live with you this morning just to say hello and good morning and also to have our responsive reading and all that type of stuff. So as you all come on, make sure you're exercising elementary etiquette and kindergarten kindness sharing that virtual love and those virtual hugs with each and every one of you. And certainly we do thank God for you joining us today. Coming up on the screen, you should see our responsive reading, Acts chapter number two. And man, this is really exciting because as we are celebrating Pentecost Sunday, we are thanking God for uh, what that means to us. And this is our founding scripture. This is what we founded our uh, church on, Community Fellowship Church. And this is what we truly believe. And this is what we truly expect. So Acts chapter number two, verses 42 through 47. 
and it reads, I'll read the black text, you'll read the red text. And as we close out at the end, we'll all read together, okay? And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. That's what happens when you're live, y'all. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Let's close out together, you all. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And certainly we do thank God for the salvation that has come through Jesus Christ. We thank God for the death, burial, and resurrection the full, finished, and complete work of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And then, so as we thank God today, and as we give him praise, as we give him glory, as we thank him for what he has done today, we want to go before God in prayer as we prepare to move forward into this worship experience today. As we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, as we celebrate the birth of the church, one of the great things about celebrating the birth of the church is that it represents a body of believers. That means that all of us, who are believers in Jesus Christ. We have a father in whom we can go to. We have a father in whom we can talk to. We have a father in whom we can take our petitions to. And so we're going to pause for this cause for just a moment, just to give God thanks, to give him praise and to give him worship and to just let him know that we put it all in his hands. So if you would, why don't you bow your heads? If you do have a prayer request, I ask that you would go ahead and load that up in the thread, whatever thread you may be watching us on or whatever platform, excuse me, you may be watching a song, we would that you would go ahead and share those prayer requests or praise reports. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you now in Jesus' name for this opportunity. We thank you for blessing us with this wonderful opportunity to share in today's programming as we celebrate the birth of today's church. Father, we ask now in Jesus' name, God, that Whatever the needs may be of anyone under the sound of my voice, Lord, whatever the issues may be, whatever the challenges may be, whatever the trials may be, Father, we just pray now in Jesus' name that as we lift them up to you in our faith, Lord, that you would lower down your favor and meet us where we are. God, we thank you now in Jesus' name for this day, for this is the day the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And Father, whatever prayer requests that may be loaded in the threads across any platform, Lord, we Lift those up to you even right now. Father, we thank you for being a good, good father. We thank you for being a wonderful father. And we pray now in Jesus' name, Lord, that as we lift our challenges and trials up to you on this day, Father, we ask now in Jesus' name that you would bless us to have a testimony to be able to say that you are truly able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now, God, bless us throughout the rest of this time as we are enjoying this programming. And Lord, we'll be so careful to praise your holy name. And we do thank you. In Jesus' name, we do pray. And everybody says, amen. Amen. Listen, God bless you today. God keep you as our prayer. Again, we're very happy and I'm very thankful to be able to share the power of Pentecost that's coming at you right from the sanctuary of the St. John Missionary Baptist Church. I preached this message a couple of years ago, had a chance to review it again. And as I was listening to it, I said, you know what? Sometimes roast tastes better when it's warmed up. So we're going to warm this up and we're going to serve you what we have left over. And I hope and pray that you're as blessed by it as I was in preparing it for you. Be blessed. We'll come to you after the programming and we'll see you right after this message. God bless you, everybody. which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power. <laughs> After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and in Samaria 
and the uttermost part of the earth. Father, we pray your blessings now in Jesus' name upon this reading and we pray that you bless us as we present to you what you have given us by way of this power of the Holy Ghost. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, you're my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to tag this text with the topic, the power of Pentecost. The power of Pentecost. Jesus made a promise here that you shall receive power. We have had mass shootings throughout this country. We have had all types of craziness taking place from coast to coast. From going to the supermarket and being gunned down just on a Saturday morning to going to school on the last day. While those who are sworn to protect and serve stand in the hallway because the commander didn't have a radio. We have a plethora of issues that are taking place. Just the other day, day before yesterday, there was a uh, massive shooting that took place at a cemetery. And multiple people were killed at the graveside service. And then last night in Houston, Texas, or and around this morning, three o'clock, nine people were killed from a U-Haul truck. And so I was thinking about that and I was looking and I was looking at the early church and I'm looking at today's, for those of you that are eschatological students, Laodicean church as opposed to the early church and I had a question. Where is the power? Anybody else have that sneaky suspicion and funny feeling asking yourself, where? The church seems to be more popular than ever. But the question is, where is the power? Even when we consider the significance of Pentecost Sunday, the observance, this observance, should really be just as festive and just as fervent for the believers as the observation of Resurrection Sunday. Pentecost, I mean, listen, Resurrection Sunday is fantastic. But can I tell you that Resurrection Sunday would mean nothing if we didn't perpetuate and propagate the message of what both Calvary and the grave stood for. Y'all give me a minute to work through this thing. I, I want you to see this here because when we look at this, the, the commercialization of Easter has really evolved into a crafty concept of a spiritual shell game. You know, the shell game where really you have just covertly moved uh, from the center Jesus Christ and you've moved the ball to either left or right where it's either bunnies and eggs or fashion and festivities. Yeah, Resurrection Sunday doesn't even carry the same power that it used to carry. Folk don't even come to sunrise service anymore getting ready for the Easter egg hunt. Yeah, yeah, there's a plethora of opportunity really that I could argue and uh, really debate the point on this topic of the church and how it should potentially revisit the approach to what that day Easter Sunday really represents. And, you know, if so today, if we revisited that and looked at the commercialization of that and we compared that and if we looked at Today, Pentecost Sunday. How many of y'all actually had that on your calendar? Where well, you knew today was Pentecost Sunday. And we're the church. Now, got, watch this. We got Easter down because the world has Easter down. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, we, we got that part down. We have Christmas down because the world has Christmas down. But when we look at this, I mean, this, 
this day, the significance of this day, this day in which the Lord's promise came to pass. Where he had told them, he says, when you go to that upper room, I want you to tarry and you tarry there and you wait until you be endued with power from on high. And then he made it very clear that I'm giving you power with a purpose. Oh man, look at here. When we see this, when we see this, we recognize that even to expand this thought, you know, this thought, it, it's interesting and worth noting that really the same, uh, you know, I guess for lack of a better term, hyperbolic commercial worldly attention is not placed on a day like today, which is Pentecost Sunday. I'm getting ready to come down your street right now. If you're sitting on the porch, just wave at me. Check this out. Today does not get the same hyperbolic commercial activity as a day like Easter, and I can tell you why. Because a day like today draws a very clear line of demarcation between the religious and the relational. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. See, today, today is something for the believer where we recognize that this is a day that the promise of God came to pass and it's been working ever since. And can I tell you what makes me shout off of that is because I found out that if his promise was good then, I wish I had somebody catching this, his promise is still good now. Uh, today draws a line of clear distinction and demarcation, not just between the religious and the relational, but also between the creation and the kinship. Watch what I'm saying here. Many of us have been running around here lying for years because Big Mama told us that, child, we are all God's children. The devil is a lie. We are not all God's children. Uh -huh, I just messed up some of y'all's theological equilibrium right there because you sit up and said, I know that preacher didn't just say that we are not all God's children, but I'm going to tell you the preacher just said we are not all God's children. I'm going to tell you why I said that we are not all God's children because Jesus said in John chapter number 8, if you were of my father's children, you would understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, but because I speak the truth and your daddy is a liar... We're not all, I told you, cameraman, I'm going to give you fits. We're not all God's children. We're all his creation, but everybody ain't a child. Huh? Everybody ain't a child. So, we, so here's the thing. When we talk about a day like Pentecost Sunday as opposed to a day like Resurrection Sunday, it leans heavier towards the believer's stance in what they really say they believe in because Easter, everybody go to church. <laughs> Little Pistol Starter, Mike, Mike, Nook, Nook, everybody. Everybody come to church. when you get up on Pentecost Sunday huh, you got a different shimmy in your body here's the thing let me hear him get out of here clock is ticking yeah see today it separates the difference between the religious and the relational between the creation and the kin and between the disciplined and the discipled Woo! Did you know you could be disciplined and go straight to hell? Watch this. You on every prayer line. You read all the scriptures. huh? You quoting all the scriptures. You telling everybody about Jesus. I mean, you can be disciplined and go straight to hell from where you sitting. Wouldn't that be a hot mess to go to hell from church? You missed all that good sin. You could have been out there just having a great time, just sinning in every club and doing everything else. But you were so disciplined coming to church and still busting hell wide open. That's a hot mess. <laughs> I got to get out of here, man. My time is running. I got I to gotta get out of here. But I need you to understand here, Pentecost to the church is like fuel to the car. It's like oil to the lamp. Pentecost Sunday is like sweetness in the sugar. Pentecost Sunday is like oxygen in the body and the divine providence of Jesus Christ when I look at this text really activates the law of physics. Can I tell you what I mean? What I simply mean is that that was a cause of sin that required salvation. Yeah, all of us had to be 
saved. We had to have a vehicle of redemption that we might be put back in right relationship with God. And unfortunately, there are many people who are great at practicing religion but are not practical in their relationship. Woo. Let me keep going here. That, that was a cause. That was a cause of sin that required salvation. And then there was a cause of penalty that required sacrifice. There was only one sacrifice that God was going to accept as sufficient. And that was going to be the shed blood of his only begotten son, Jesus. Let me say this. That's why whenever my good Muslim uh, fellows and my good Muslim associates come and try to tell me that Allah and God are the same. No, they're not the same. Because Allah don't have a son. Y'all not talking to me. See, the power of the church needs to be able to stand in a position to where you can defend the faith. What Paul told Timothy, he said, preach sound doctrine. He said, proclaim the gospel and defend the faith. And ain't no sense in you. Jehovah's Witness come knocking on your door. You ducking and dodging. Shh, tell them to be quiet. I don't want them to know I'm in here. <laughs> huh? Because you know they come ready. Huh? Yeah, y'all, let, let me tell y'all something right quick. St. John, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, this ain't the first congregation I've seen. I've been preaching 35 years. You hear what I'm saying? So I know how this thing goes as far as when it comes to church. And so with that in mind, when I talk about this, and I'm going to lay this out here because we see that the divine providence of Jesus Christ, that resurrection activated the law of physics because that cause of sin, required salvation and I'm leading up to Acts I'm going there this is just all my intro okay I ain't even hit the sermon yet I'm just saying hey y'all and I'm just kind of setting it up right but here's the thing that was a cause of penalty that required sacrifice and then equally the cause of sacrifice mandated a living response that's why the Bible tells us when Paul says in the book of Romans, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your, watch this, reasonable. And the reason behind it is this, if he died for you, the least you could do is live for him. Huh? And so with that, we see here that the cause of sacrifice mandates a living response and then that response commissions and commands the benefactors, which is you and I. That commission commands us to share and spread the news to all that the liberty of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection is available for everybody. Yeah, yeah I've, I've often said that one of, one of, if not the greatest threat to the efficacy of today's church, I think one of the biggest threats is not the pandemic. One of the biggest threats is not the millennials and the young people. You know, this is the generation I was sharing with the brothers last night. You know, the young people, that's the generation of resignation. <laughs> Baby, they'll shoot you the deuce just if you, ain't, if you ain't popping with them like they want you to, they out. Huh? There you go. I mean, they moving on to the next thing. Think about it. Instagram, just steady scrolling, swiping and scrolling, swiping and scrolling. So their attention is only gonna be so long, right? But the point is that I'm trying to say that's not even the biggest threat to today's church. The biggest threat to today's church, watch this y'all, is the zombie effect. Existing without relevance. Ooh. Yep, we have larger auditoriums, but lesser anointing. We have houses of worship that are now called worship centers. Is anybody, uh, look here, I, I'm, I have a round trip ticket. I'm going to the house tomorrow. Huh? You hear what I'm saying? Watch this, here's the thing. Preaching social media superstars and celebrities who have honed in on brand building skills without regard to biblical heresy. Huh? This is where we are today. There's more hype than holiness. There's more swag than substance. There is more emotion than devotion. Oh, let me go ahead. Since I got your theological equilibrium all jacked up, let me go ahead and get you right here. Because not to mention the perpetual addiction to the incessant desire for that instant gratification message of name it and claim it. 
blab it and grab it, call it and haul it, catch it and snatch it, whatever you want to call it. All of that right there is what has caused the church to exist without relevance because it leads into a fraudulent faith builder that suggests to us, and watch this, you've shouted off of it, you've been wrong, but you've shouted off of it, that you can call those things and be not as though they were. Uh, that's not what the Bible says. If you don't believe me right now, you can go check it out. Romans 4 and 17. Look at it right now. And I can tell you right now that grammatically there is an apposition. It's called an appositive that suggests that we're speaking about Abraham's father, God. And there's a predicating precedent that you have to be able to pull off before you can call those things that be not as though they were. And that predicating precedent is this. You got to be able to quicken the dead. Wait a minute. So if you're going to bring the dead back to life, that means you have to be ruler over both life and death to tell life to release itself to death and tell death to release itself back to life. And then you can call those things that be not as though they were. Now watch how crazy it is for you to shout off of that in an erroneous situation. When you shout off and the preacher got you going and he said, call those things that be not as though they were. Try it right now. Call something. Call something. Call something. <laughs> I'm preaching better than you saying amen. Because I'm getting to a point. See, the power has left for many reasons. Yeah, we hucking and bucking and jumping and shouting off of stuff that the devil is sitting there looking like, poor children. They not even quoting the Bible right. Huh? Look at this. <clears throat> I'm out the gate early on this one because I want to find out what has interfered with, what has blurred with the visibility and what has quelled the impact of the power of Pentecost. I, I want to know. I, I want to know. I don't know about y'all, but I want to know. Is there anyone besides me that's paying attention to the fact that we have had over 20 mass shootings in the last couple of weeks? Is there anybody besides me paying attention to the fact that people are growing more savage every day? Is anybody besides me paying attention to the fact that we have more people sitting depressed in the pews where the people ought to be praying to people through the valleys of the shadow of death and through the issues of life, but yet you got people walking out of the sanctuary putting 38s to their heads and blowing their brains out. Is there anybody besides me? It amazes me to know that here it is. We have the vaccine for all of this vexation. Yet no one's administering the dosages on a regular basis. I'm appalled to see that these recent horrific events, I don't know about you, that, that there have not sparked, or there hasn't been a spark of an outcry in the pews. An outpouring for the church, watch this y'all, to do something very novice. Pray. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm amazed. And I'm not talking about that short, memorized, popular, mechanical, watered down, repetitive recitation that you say is a prayer. Y'all do know there's a difference between saying a prayer and praying a prayer. I'm about to get out of here. Look here, when I get ready to close, Mr. Organist, just follow me. Don't get started too early. But when I tell you the train is leaving, let's go, all right? So here's the thing. You got to understand here. I want you to understand here that if we would just get back to number one, pray and tell your neighbor, pray. Yeah, see, you got to pray. You got to pray. And I'm talking about that type of prayer that is fervent, that type of prayer that is prevailing, that type of prayer that is soul-stirring, that type of prayer that is self-examining, that type of prayer that'll pull the crackhead out of the crack house, that type of prayer that will pull a person who's down and out straight up. See, where well, we pray, and when we pray, when believers pray, let me tell y'all what happened. Can I tell you right quick? Because I'm going to leave y'all in just a few minutes. Let me tell you what happens when believers pray. When believers pray, attitudes begin to change hurts, begin to heal burdens, begin to live fears, begin to flee doubts, begin to dispel demons, begin to triple mountains, begin to move walls, begin to crumble, sinners begin to respond, miracles begin to happen, light begins to shine, faith begins to build. When you pray, glory begins to fall, hope begins to rise, gifts begin to operate, God begins to work, and can I tell you when you pray, all of heaven 
rejoicing. Where's the power? It's going to probably be about E flat when I get ready to leave, but I might shoot the F sharp. But where is the power? Because I feel something pushing me now. Where is the power of Pentecost? The power of Pentecost is manifested in effect when there is proclamation, explanation, demonstration, transformation, and manifestation. See, it used to be that when you were sick, we didn't close the church. We said, come on down to the altar. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. See, during the pandemic, I got dazed and confused. I, I was trying to figure out how is it that we got to close the church and we supposed to know Jehovah Rapha. Y'all missing the shout right here. I was confused because I thought you're supposed to bring the sick to the church. <laughs> let, me, let me get out of here because I feel something pushing me here. I, I was confused because I'm wondering where is the power? Where's the power? Where's the power? When I look at this, the problem is, is that many people come to church on a weekend and week out basis and never get an encounter with God. When's the last time you seen somebody come and they were sick and you laid hands on them and they were healed? When is the last time you saw somebody come in who you knew had demon possession or who was rocking crazy out of their mind and the mother, see, I'm old school Baptist, y'all. We had the old mourner's bitch and we had the mother's board. And baby, that mother's board would get Valvoline, Pinzol, Crisco. It didn't matter. They would find something to slap on you. And baby, by the time, look, you might have came in bound, but you're going to leave free tonight. I don't know how they get down to Florida, but that's how they do it in Texas. I'm telling you right now, you got to understand that I began to look at this and I said, the problem is, is that the church ain't showing nothing. Are oh, you saying a whole lot? You sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. You look real good. You dress up real good. You sound real good, but the church ain't showing nothing. When's the last time you seen somebody come in and they were bound and they were busted and disgusted and they were down and out and you had just a couple of people who actually had the nerve to have some discernment about themselves and they just went over and said, baby, I'm praying for you and just a touch. Got to get out of here. I got to go. There are many forms and references of power. Organizationally, corporately, personally, spiritually. But however, I want you to understand St. John and those of you in the listening audience online, I want you to know that no matter how large you may be, <laughs> no matter how solvent you may be, huh? No matter how celebrated you may be, you've got to be clear to remember that your power comes from the Holy Ghost. Your power doesn't come in the fact that you can go down to the bank and tell the bank whatever you want to tell them, write a check and the bank bounce. Ain't nobody impressed with that. Your power doesn't come because you are a celebrated individual or because you're so large. The power for the church, if I read this Bible right, the Lord said that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost. I know some of us are educated now. We have so many degrees. You can change our names to Fahrenheit, so Holy Ghost is a bit aggressive. We'll say Holy Spirit for you. And for those of you that are theological academicians in the seminarian level, we'll say paraclete for you. But for those of us that are down home like me and straight up out the country, I'm going to say straight up Holy Ghost. Did you hear what I said? Huh? Because it's something about that Holy Ghost. <laughs> something about that Holy Ghost that'll hold you when you don't want to be held. Do I have anybody in here? It'll make you do what you don't want to do. Huh? He'll, he'll make you go where you don't want to go. He'll make you apologize when you're mad as nine butcher knives. <laughs> see, my, see my, my life is too jacked up and crazy. I ain't got no time for no cute Holy Spirit and paraclete. I need the straight up Holy Ghost. Because there's sometimes, and now y'all ain't going to tell the truth, I'll tell the truth. There's sometimes just some folk that can run you so hot. Now, this is how we say it in Texas. You be ready to go. 
and that Holy Ghost comes in and he just grabs you. Is, it, is there anybody besides me who still has their life because the Holy Ghost stepped in? You still got your mind because the Holy Ghost stepped in. You still got your joy because the Holy Ghost, talk to me somebody. You still got your peace because the Holy Ghost stepped in. You were losing your mind and thought to you weren't going to make it another day, but the Holy Ghost Somebody ought to just shout, Holy Ghost. Look at here. The Holy Ghost stepped in. And so when we look at this, our text in verse number six today shows us this. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to give you all a reason to stand in just a minute. Sit down for a second. But our text in verse number six, look at what it shows us here. It shows us something that the question of the disciples comes about asking about the coming kingdom and Jesus doesn't rebuke them when they kept asking. Instead, he refers back to Luke 24 so that they would know what they were asking. They didn't even know what they were asking. Are you gonna restore the kingdom at this time? Are you gonna restore the kingdom? Jesus refers back to Luke 24. The conversation goes on in verse number seven, what's really cool, check it out, he goes, and as he goes on to explain that God has not revealed his timetable to us, and that there is no need to speculate because he had placed times and seasons in his hands. In some versions it says he has put the power in his hands. It's important to understand that when we talk about Kronos and Kairos, Kronos is the time, Kairos is the season. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad to know that the times and the seasons are both under the authority of God's hands. Because there ought to be two or three people in here just like me, folk wrote you off at one time in a season. But God's hand was on that thing and because they wrote you off at one time in a season, they looked around and trying to figure out how you still here and why. Because the Lord's power is over times and seasons. He says, I have authority on the timetable and I need somebody to know today that weeping may endure for a night, but because he has power over times and seasons, tell your neighbor joy. Joy comes in the morning. Be not weary in well-doing for in due season. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but somebody needs to know that your season is due. And God's going to show you how your season is due. And he's going to make you a billboard for everybody to read that wrote you off. Let me keep going because I feel like preaching a little bit now. So here it is, we see in verse number seven that he goes on to explain that God has not revealed his timetable to us. And can I tell you why? Because if God had told you and shown you years ago how he was gonna bless you today, you'd have never made it to today. Some of us ought to be happy that the Lord kept from us what he was going to do for us until he did for us what he already did for us. Is there anybody in here with me? And so with that, he is setting them up. Let me get to verse number eight. He's setting them up to let them know that the important thing is not to be curious about the future. Woo! He says, y'all are talking about the coming kingdom. Jesus says, hold on. Don't be worried about what's coming. I need you to worry about what's going on right now. But I want you to be busy right now in the present sharing the message of God's kingdom because he says, but that conjunction that changes the trajectory of a thought process. He says, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Let me drop a footnote here, park here parenthetically and pause for the cause for this just moment. Maybe when we are asking, praying and waiting on God to do something, we should use that time to get busy. Instead of sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time, watching time roll away, maybe while we're waiting on God and praying for God to do something for us, ah, tell your neighbor, get busy. Yeah. That's why the Bible says that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Yeah. There is no reason for your strength to be renewed if waiting consisted of sitting. Uh, the reason your strength needs to be renewed when you're waiting is because you're serving. Because the word wait does not mean sit. The word wait means to serve. And so you need to just tell your neighbor, just hunt them right quick. Tell them, get busy. Get busy in the present telling the hopeless that there is help for the hopeless. Get busy. 
busy in the present telling the dying world that Jesus is still saving. Get busy in the present being a witness. I'm coming to a close now because Jesus said that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, but there is a reason you got that power. The reason you got that power, he makes it very clear in the text so that you can be a witness. He says, I want you to be a witness. Witness is a key word here. And in the book of Acts, it's used some 29 times. It's used either as a verb or a noun. A witness is somebody who tells what they have seen and heard. Oh, Lord have mercy. A witness is somebody who tells what they have seen and heard. And when you are on the witness stand in a courtroom, can I tell you that the judge ain't interested in your opinion? The judge is not interested in your ideas. The judge wants you to be a witness. I want you to tell me what you have seen and what you have heard. And here is the problem in today's church. And here is a reason that I believe the power is missing. It's because there are too many of us that can't say what we both have seen and heard. Today we have a great deal of people People who go about soul winning and while only some of God's people have a calling to evangelize I want you to understand all of God's people are called to witness ah let me say that again you may not be an evangelist but if you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ if you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ you may not be an evangelist but you at least ought to be a witness do I have anybody in here the base witness that any believer can share that doesn't require any hermeneutical research it doesn't require homiletical proficiency it doesn't require exegetical expertise nor does it require or require expositional prowess the base witness that you can always give to anybody you ain't gotta be no preacher you ain't gotta be no teacher you ain't gotta go to seminary you can simply tell somebody this if God could save a wretch like me I'm getting ready to go now if God could save a wretch like me then surely he can do the same for you because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me I don't know about you but my soul cries out hallelujah should have been dead and gone should have been locked away for a long time but God the power of Pentecost is not about tongue talking it's not about emotional exhilaration Pentecost is about power come on somebody say power Pentecost is about power it's a rich compilation of dunamis power, exus power, exousia power, dunaton power, kratos power. It's about specific power that's provided to a specific purpose and a specific people to tell somebody about the somebody that somebody told you about. That is, I'm leaving y'all now. Verse number eight says, as he introduces to us, this dynamite power where the Holy Ghost gives us the ability and the might to be able to carry out the will of God. We have this power. You say you can't do it by yourself. God never intended for you to do it by yourself. Another lie we say is that he'll put no more on you than you can bear. But I came by to tell somebody that is a lie. The reason God puts more on you huh? then you can bear huh? is so you can lean so you can lean huh? on his power huh? listen I gotta tell y'all here huh? the power of Pentecost huh? ought to tell you and me huh? let's go get them huh? come on and tell your neighbor huh? let's go get them huh? let's go get the drug addicts huh? let's go get the prostitutes huh? let's go get the alcoholics huh? let's go get the depressed huh? let's go get the frustrated huh? let's go get the downtrodden huh? let's go get the hurt 
hurt. Let's go get those in despair. Let's go get those children who are wayward. Get that wayward son. Get that rebellious daughter. Get that missing father. Get that angry mother. What is the formula? Preacher, I heard you say that we're missing the power of Pentecost. Let me give you three things on how you can get the power back. Y'all might know this. Number one, you got to reach up. You got to reach up in your worship. You are there. And in your worship, you got to say to God that you are until you hear him say, I am. That's worship. When you worship, it honors the Father. When you worship, it magnifies the Lord. When you worship, it sanctifies the church. When you worship, it blesses the individual. When you worship, it upholds the world. When you worship, it restores joy. When you worship, it disturbs the devil. Can I tell you this? The devil is confused. That's why you ought to always enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Hell may be breaking out all over your house, but if I can just get to the house, and give God some praise. The devil gets confused. You want the power. You got to reach up. But then if you want the power, you got to reach in. Watch me, St. John. You got to reach in. And reaching in is where you become willful in your belief. Because when you reach in, you become a faithful believer. And you activate the power. How do you do that? Because when you reach in, you'll do what you ought to do. You'll say what you ought to say. You'll go where you ought to go. You'll be who you ought to be. And when we walk in the power of faithfulness, we become unified. Look at the church. Look at how the church becomes powerful when it is unified. Listen, when it's unified, it pulls together everybody for a common cause. A unified Unified church labors together on one accord. A unified church prays together for specific needs. A unified church stands together against the enemy. A unified church bows together at the foot of the cross. A unified church stays together through difficult times. Do I have anybody? I'm leaving y'all now. Number one. You got to reach up. Number two, you got to reach in. But here's the last one. You got to reach out. Watch me now. Look at your neighbor and say, go to work. Look at your, y'all ain't looking at nobody with your rebel yourself. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, go to work. You need to get out of here. It's not about what you do while you're in here. It's about what you do. When you go out, that's why Jesus says, go. He never says, come and stay. He says, go. You got to reach out. When you reach out, you activate the power to bring comfort to the lonely, to bring joy to the sorrowful, to bring peace to the worry, to bring inspiration to the weary, to bring deliverance to the captive. Where is the power? I'm glad you asked. It's in your testimony. Where is the power? It's in your witness. Is there any Anybody here that can say like me, I've got something to say. No, I didn't go to seminary. No, I don't have 12 degrees. No, I'm not the smartest on the block. But I can tell you that when I look back over my life and think things over, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, Tell me, where would I be? You got to tell it, the songwriter say. Go tell it on the mountains, over the hills, and everywhere. Not just that he was born, but tell him he died. Didn't he die? Jesus died on Calvary's cross. But bright early... 
bright and early. Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands. Because you've got power, you can go get them. Somebody here has been praying for a child. I'm telling you now, go get them. Somebody here has been praying for their husband. I'm telling you now, go get them. Somebody here has been praying for their wife. I'm telling you now, go get them. Tell them that living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried, all my sins far away, rising he justified, freed me forever, and one day, do I have anybody, one day, he's coming back, ain't God alright, don't fool me, St. John, ain't God alright, I know he's alright. Well, I hope and pray that you were blessed by today's programming, the power of Pentecost, understanding what that power is. We have the power to be witnesses. We have the power to go and get them, whoever it is in your family, whatever it is in your life, whatever the situations may be. I hope that you understood what that message was speaking about on how because the Lord has given us not only the authority, but he's given us the ability to be able to be game changers, to be able to be change agents. And as we celebrate sure. Pentecost, as we celebrate this day, it's my prayer that each and every one of you will be inspired, will be uplifted and empowered to be a change agent. That's really what this message was about. But guess what? You can't be a change agent until you've allowed the agent to change you. And that simply means that we have to have at least accepted the full, finished, and complete work of Jesus Christ, that we might receive him in the pardon of our sins. And as we receive him in the pardon of our sins and accept the full, finished, and complete work, then we're saved. And the text says that when we call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. As we hear about that name, we believe, and as we believe, we call, and as we're saved, it is at that point of salvation that we are blessed to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And once we receive that power of the Holy Spirit and let the agent of God through Jesus Christ change our lives, then we can become change agents. If you're with us today and if you haven't made that decision to become a change agent, it's my prayer that you would make that decision today. You see the invitation card up on the screen. You see that the opportunities are there for salvation. The opportunities are there for restoration. The opportunities are there to connect. And it's my prayer that you, by all means, would not allow anything to distract you from this moment of decision that's a game changer in your life that can make you a game changer in the lives of others. We're going to pray and ask God's blessings upon your decision today. The invitation is extended. You can text it. You can email it. You'll see the QR codes come up. You can just scan the QR code, the connect form. Let us know who you are and what your decision is. And we'll stand with you in faith. And we'll make sure that we do all that we can to walk out your discipleship journey with you. Why don't you pray with me? Father, we thank you now in Jesus name again, as we pray your blessings upon this time. Lord, we thank you for this word today. Help us, Lord, to know that we are change agents and we can go get them. Lord, help us to know, God, that we can't go get them until we responded to what you did to come get us. Father, I pray now if someone is under the sound of my voice that does not know you in the pardon of their sins, that they would receive the gift in which you've given by faith. And Lord, I ask now in Jesus' name, Lord, for whatever decision that's being made, if one is being made, that you would help us to properly steward that decision, to properly steward that soul, and to properly steward that individual that we might be able to be a blessing to them as we celebrate on this birthday of the church, the power of Pentecost and the salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray this prayer and we seal this prayer in Jesus name. And we all said, amen, amen. All right, everybody, God bless you today. Happy birthday to the church. We thank God for each and every one of you. Don't forget to join us Tuesday night this Tuesday night for our Bible study. We're in on the Acts and we are picking up an Acts chapter number eight. And I'm telling you right now, if you missed last week and heard Saul's testimony of himself, as, as well as I should say his transformation as Paul, you really missed the treat. But we're gonna pick it right back up in Acts chapter number eight. 
We're going to start at verse number five. We'll review verses one through four, but we'll start at verse number five. And then we'll be moving right on into the action, all right? You all pray for me as I get ready to go and handle triple duty today. And I pray that you were blessed today. And I leave you as I always do with our closing doxology. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Go get them. Go get them. Happy birthday, church. Be blessed in Jesus' name until Tuesday night. Take care.